Welcome to Work From Your Happy Place, the podcast that equips you with the tools, know-how, and motivation to live your dreams and find your happy place. Be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter for a recap of the week's guests and a preview of what's in store. To sign up, simply text the word happy place with no space to 33444. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the host of Work From Your Happy Place, Belinda Ellsworth. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Work From Your Happy Place. I'm your host, Belinda Ellsworth, and I've got a delightful guest in store for you today. So inspirational. I have Kelly Falardo with me, and Kelly has been a burn survivor since the age of two when she sustained burns on 75% of her body. She found a way to go from near death to success from the ugly scar-faced girl to the TEDx stage, not once, but twice. A documentary about her life story called Still Beautiful, launched on TV Plus Goldcast, launched a video that has almost 10 million views. Now she is a full-time best-selling author, strategist, and coaches people to become best-selling authors. On Christmas Day, Global TV announced Kelly as one of the most inspirational people of 2020. It is my pleasure to welcome Kelly to our show today. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Belinda. I'm, I was so excited about this morning that I was going to get to be on your show today and, and you know, share with you and your, your listeners. So I'm excited. Oh, great. Well, I'm excited too. Gosh, what, uh, what, what an accomplishment and what an honor to be one of the most inspirational people of 2020, especially since 2020 was a very difficult year. So <laughs> that is, that's pretty amazing. So let's I know. Just, yep, you bet. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, let's fill in some of those gaps from the bio and just um, take us along your journey a little bit and how you actually came to do what you are doing today. And, uh, and exactly what you're doing for folks. Great. So, yeah, I got burnt as a two-year-old. We were living on a farm, and my cousins were throwing shingles in a fire. And a spark came out and landed on my dress, and I exploded. And so I spent four months in the hospital. Every two days, I'd be in the operating room. And then every two years, until I was 20 years old, I'd have to go back for more surgeries. Because they needed me to grow so that I would have more skin for them to work with. And so I never, ever thought I would have a good life. I mean, I was known as the ugly Scarface girl, right? Behind my back. Of course, they, a lot of them wouldn't say it in front of me, but I found out through the grapevine that, you know, that's what was happening. I, I remember watching, walking past my teacher's desk and someone had drawn a picture of me and it had a circle on it with scribbles all over it and it said Scarface on the top. Oh, and I know I wasn't supposed to see it. My teacher had already dealt with it, but still I saw it and it broke my heart because I knew I was the Scarface girl and I knew my scars were never going to go away because my doctor was, was take, trying to take my scars away. Right. And I remember praying to God when I was about 15 years old saying, you know, dear God, please don't make me wake up in the morning, but if I have to, can you at least make me scarless so I can be pretty like all the other girls? You know, thank you, amen. And I still woke up in the morning and I still saw the ugly scars. And I thought, I'm never going to be beautiful. My doctor can't take my scars away. God can't take my scars away. I'm always going to be the Scarface girl. So then at what point then did, when did things begin to change for you? Because um, clearly I'm, I'm looking at you right now and you're not the Scarface girl anymore. So like, when did that transformation start to really happen? You know, I think it was, it was a gradual thing. It wasn't something that, okay, now, Hey, now I feel beautiful. It, in fact, it probably didn't happen until I was in my forties. And I remember going to a garage sale and um, me and my former husband went to this garage sale and this lady look up, took a look at me and she said, they couldn't do better than that. Oh my goodness. I know, right? I was shocked. I was like, oh, like if she only knew how many surgeries I've had, she might not be saying this. Oh. And I, you know, got back in the car and my, my husband said, Kel, she didn't mean it that way. And I said, she meant it how she said it. And I was so hurt. Um, I, I took a look at her and I said, you know what? I happen to think I look pretty damn good. And I turned around and I walked away. And I thought to myself, you know, later on in the day, I thought, why am I letting a complete stranger take my power away? 
not once have my kids yep. or my family or my friends, not once have any of them ever said, Mom or Cal, I would love you more if you were scarless. And yet we let strangers take our power away and make us feel ugly. And that was when I that was one of my turning points. And I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done feeling like the ugly girl. She doesn't know who I am or what I've been through or how many surgeries I've had or how many times I've prayed to God or, you know, or or wanted to, you know, end my life. She had no idea what I've been through. And yet I'm letting her judge me. So then how did you get on the path of doing coaching and what you're doing for others today? About 10 years ago is when I went to a woman's event. And at that time, I had a different business. I had a, a mobile scrapbook store. So I would go around and I would teach people how to scrapbook and sell them supplies. I had an actual cube van that I would drive around. And it was cool. I love the business. But her and I got talking and she said, you know what, Kelly, you need to sell that business you're in and become a speaker. And I said, what? I'm a burn survivor. So what? And she goes, no, people will be so inspired by your story. And I thought, okay, I don't know what the heck you're talking about, but whatever. And (laughs) I went home that night and I told my husband, I said, I'm going to be a speaker. And he said, well, how are you going to do that? I said, I don't know, but it's going to happen. And sure enough, that night, he proceeded to give me all these reasons why I couldn't be a speaker. But he was also thinking about, we were almost bankrupt at that time. You know, he wasn't working. I had a job. Um, Our marriage was toxic. Like, there was not a lot of good stuff going on in our lives other than our three kids. And so I know what he was thinking is, like, who's going to listen to you? You're not successful. You're not like Tony Robbins. You're not like Oprah Winfrey. You don't have a story. Like, how can you be a speaker? And I said, I don't know. I, I, I have no clue, but it's going to happen. And sure enough, Charmaine got her and I to speak on a stage together. And we did an Ellen show. So she was Ellen and I was the gaff. And sure enough, it was just hilarious because I was speaking. And then I saw these people crying in the audience. And I'm looking around on the stage, right? I'm looking behind me and I'm like, what's happening? Did somebody fall and hurt themselves? Like, why are people crying? And I heard that little voice say to me, they're crying at your story. And then I'm I'm talking some more and all of a sudden everybody starts laughing. And again, I'm looking on the stage, you know, I'm looking all around and I'm thinking, what is going on? Like, is somebody behind me with a clown nose on their nose or something? Like, what is going Mm -hmm. on? Why are people laughing? And I heard that little voice in my head say to me again, they're laughing at your story. It's funny. And so that was the start. Um, I took a course from a girl that taught people how to be keynote speaker. And then she said, okay, Cal, now you need to be an author. And I was like, I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, who knows how to write a book? I mean, now I know. But at that point, I was like, are you kidding me? That's going to take like thousands of hours and thousands of dollars. And I don't have that kind of time or money. And she's like, no, you need to write a book so that when people hear you speak, they can buy your book and they learn more about you. Second of all, when people hear you speak and they can't pay you, then you can sell your book and make money. And the third reason is to build credibility. And so those were the reasons I, I did it. And then I became a best-selling author and away I went from there. And now I coach people to become best-selling authors. Oh, that is fantastic. And going through it, certainly people ask me all the time, how do you become, you know, a, pe- a speaker or how do you become a coach? And I said, well, you got to kind of have the experience and have done something that you can teach others how to do. So those are the best coaches. And Uh, There are some people that just kind of go to coaching classes and school and then coach people. But I think the best coaches are certainly the ones that have walked the walk, such as yourself. So that is fantastic. So what's the what is the name of your book? So my first book is called No Risk, No Rewards. And what I love about this is I never understood the power of a book until I went to this woman's event and gave my book to this lady who was from Africa. And so she emailed me and she said, you know what, Kelly, 
you need to come. You need to come to Africa. We just had a fire in one of our slums. A hundred people died. A hundred people are now living with their burns and they don't know what to do. Can you come? And so I got some sponsorship together and me and one of my um, mentors, we went to Africa. We went to Kenya at the time. And it was so incredible because we did this event for teenagers and I hear them chanting and they're saying, I am me, the best me I can be. I am me, the best me I can be. I am me, the best me I can be. And I was, I was looking at them going, what the heck is going on? They were reading it out of my book. I am me, the best me I can wow. be. And I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that my book was going to be used in Africa to teach teenage girls about self-esteem. That is so amazing. And that had to be so incredibly rewarding in that moment, like in that moment that they were actually quoting you and that was having an impact on their lives that had to be incredibly rewarding. Oh, it was, it was incredible. Like it it hit me. It was like, wow, I never thought that 10 years ago when I wrote that book that I was going to be making a difference in Africa. Wow. That is incredible. So how has your business then changed your lifestyle today? I mean, like, even in these last 10 years, it's probably changed dramatically. Oh, it changed dramatically because, you know, I'm a single mom. And so okay. being a single mom means that, um, okay, so this is crazy. After I left my husband, I also had a job. So I go to my work and I get the worst performance review ever. So this is four months after my, my boss says to me, are you going to be excited to come to work on Monday? I'm relieved if you don't have to. And I was like, oh, hit me right to my core. Because I knew what was happening, right? She was like, you, you guys either quit or be fired because you're not doing your job. And she knew I was already speaking. She knew I already had my first book. I was on to my second book. And I'm thinking, I don't have a husband anymore to support me. I'm living in my aunt and uncle's basement. So I'm not even, here I am like 44 years old thinking I'm like a a loser. I'm not thinking I'm a powerful woman. I'm thinking I'm a loser. Like, who are you to leave your kids and move in, you know, just so you can be happy. And that just hit me. And so I went home and that little voice said to me, are you going to be excited to work, come to work on Monday or relieved if you don't have to? And I remember reading this, this Christian businesswoman's magazine and it, I came to the middle and it said in big black letters, why do you not trust that God will provide you everything you need? And I slammed it shut. I was so mad because I knew I needed to be a speaker, but I was like, how am I going to do this? Like, how am I going to live? How am I going to afford to pay for my bills and stuff? So anyways, I went into work the next morning and I asked myself that question one more time. Are you going to be excited to come to work on Monday or relieved if you don't have to? And I sent my boss an email and I said, you are right. Today's my last day. And I packed up my office and I left. And so I've been like through tons of ups and downs. Like, you know, it sounds like I've been through some incredible stuff and I really have. But if you guys also saw all the downs that I had, it's, it's crazy. But what I love about it, I love that I get to be creative with my business. I mm-hmm. love that I get to be my own boss. I love that I had this idea. I also became a painter six years ago. And I took one of my paintings and I had it made into a blanket. And the blanket says, you are loved, you are needed, you are wanted. And so I ordered like 1,500 of them. And then I would go around to different rotary clubs and I would speak and share my story. And the Rotary Club would sponsor blankets. And then I would take those blankets and we would go to the the summer camp where the burn kids are and we would give blankets out to the burn kids. And so I love that I have that freedom to be flexible with my business, you know, and just do what I want to do. Now, Mm -hmm. the, the extra layer to that is that being a single mom means that I have to make money. Right. Whereas I've got some friends that are moms that have businesses. And one of my good friends, she said, yeah, I don't really have to work at my business. My husband just gives me an allowance and I don't need to worry about it. Right. And I'm thinking, (laughs) oh, my gosh, I just wish. Right. Like 
every dime I get goes to support my kids and myself. And so I mm-hmm. have to make money. Right. So, so I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. <laughs> well, it's, it answers it a bit is you've got some more freedom and you're getting to do what you want but it's not without challenges and it's not without sacrifice and it's not necessarily a walk in the park, which I think a lot of people look at entrepreneurs and they see they get to create their own schedule, but they don't realize you still have to create a schedule and you still have to support your family and you still have to get things figured out. And not everybody has the luxury of like your friend. In fact, probably less people have the luxury of your friend than people like, you know, like yourself and myself. I've always uh, supported my family. I've been a single mom too. I'm not currently at the moment, but mm-hmm. I was to two yep. teenagers. And, uh, and, and you have to, you have to be on your game. You have to stay the course and you have to be in, especially when you're inspiring others, you have to remain in some state of being inspired yourself or being happy and, you know, to continue to go out and inspire others. And there's days where it's just tough. Absolutely. You're totally right about that. You know, and especially because when my, my husband started the divorce proceedings, I was like, oh my God, now what? Mm -hmm. Like now what? And then it was like game on, right? Like then the war started and, you know, you're a single mom, you know what that's all about. And so I still remember, this is one of my strategies that I teach people. Have you, do you have somebody on your phone that whenever you see their name, it just annoys you? (laughs) Right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was going through my divorce, every time I saw his name, it would trigger me into anger. And it, it could be a nice text message or it could be a phone call. But if I saw his name, I would be triggered into anger. And I was like, okay, this isn't good because I need to stay empowered. And it got to the point where I couldn't even look at my phone like an hour or two before I got on stage. Because then if, if a text message came from him, that would trigger anger in me. And then I couldn't you know, do my best job. So I thought this has to change. I can't, I can't keep it this way. So what I did is I changed his name on my phone. What do you think I changed his name to, Belinda? <laughs> what do you think I changed it to? Oh, gosh. I have no clue. Okay. Well, and when I ask people on stage, what do you think I changed his name to? Inevitably, somebody will say asshole or something like that. And yeah. I said, no, because that triggers more anger. I don't want anger. I need, right. to, I need to keep my mindset you know, positive and happy. Well, I changed his name to poor soul. And so every time I'd see his name and it said poor soul, I would say, oh, what does poor soul want? (laughs) So so I never got angry again. I would, it would create empathy for him instead of anger. Now that is awesome. It is. It was one of my number one strategies. And so I, um, now his name is his name because it doesn't bother me anymore. But when I was going through my divorce, I had to have his name as poor soul so that I could stay in a positive and happy state. Wow. That is a great story. I know I, I went, when you are going through a divorce and then it gets, it's front, it's, it's hard anyway, emotionally, but then if it's a tough divorce where you have battles in there over things and kids and oh everything. There's a lot of stuff that happens. And I remember being very angry too. And then, and a lot of things that happened that weren't very kind uh, on his part. And I finally just had to forgive him and like even welcome him over. Like I, in because the, you know, he was still picking the kids up and whatever. And all of my friends and family said, why are you forgiving him? Why? And I said, I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it for me because I need to be happy. And so I I don't need to have hate in my heart. I need to have forgiveness in my heart. And so if I can do that, I can go on with my life and do all the things that I need to do for me and for other people. This isn't about him. And, And people have a hard time sometimes understanding that, right? Yep. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, forgiveness is a big piece. And 
yeah, it's not always easy to forgive. It isn't. But you're right. It totally for you. It's not for him. It's for you so that you can move forward and you can, you know, keep keep it in your happy place. That's absolutely right. So have you identified for yourself, you know, like what are a couple of skill sets that you think have served you well over these years? One is creativity. Okay. So I think it's very important um, because I get bored very easily. I've never had the same job for more than two and a half years in my life. So being a speaker has been the longest career I've had. And so I'm really proud of myself for that. And, (laughs) And the biggest reason I believe is because I'm able to be creative. So when something isn't working, like, for example, when COVID hit, I lost all my speaking gigs. Yep. So I pivoted into coaching people to become authors because all of a sudden people were saying, well, Cal, look, I want to learn how to write a book. I want to learn how to be a best-selling author. And 2020 has been, and 2021 even, has been my best years ever in business. So I believe oh, that, that is great. Yeah, I believe that that is one of my best skill sets is being able to be creative. Uh, the other one that a lot of people will say is is also another one of my my uh, mindset things is that um, I'm able to shift on a dime. So I'm able to like take action and move forward. So my coaches have said this to me a few times. They said, you know, one of the great things about you, Kelly, is that if you think you want to do something, you will just go ahead and put the plan in action and you'll do it and you'll be doing it like the next day. Whereas a lot of times what happens is that people will think they have to overthink it. And if they don't know all the pieces, Mm -hmm. they won't even get started at all. Whereas I'm the kind of person, if I want to do something, I'll start it. And if I don't know how to do it, I'll ask for help. Whereas a lot of people are too scared to even ask for help because they see it as a sign of weakness. I see it as a sign of strength because to me, that means that you're willing to put yourself out there and say, hey, I need help. How can you help me? And that has been, those are like some of my strengths. I have no problem asking for help. That is great. I teach that too. It's like, um, it's part of being brave is, is, is not being afraid to say, I don't know how to do this and I could use your help because then you're learning and people generally, people for the most part, this is what I find. People can be ugly for sure. Just like those things that happen to you. That's the worst side of people. But I believe that people for the most part really truly do want to help others when they have the opportunity if they have the knowledge, if they have an experience, if they have a resource, if they have a connection even to lead you to someone um, that can do that. So I think that's, I think that's incredible advice. So outstanding accomplishment. I'd have to say probably the uh, documentary had to be one of your highlights. Yeah. Oh my God. That was crazy. The documentary definitely was one of my highlights. And it started because all I did was send a book proposal to a broadcaster. And they loved my story called Still Beautiful. And they were like, okay, do you want to produce this documentary yourself or do you want to co-produce it with us? And then we will put some money in the pot. And I said, absolutely. I'm happy to co-produce it with you guys because they're the experts. And when you co-produce it with a broadcaster, they make it the way they want it. And you know you're going to get it on TV. And so, yeah, it was an incredible experience. It was very emotional. They came and they filmed me for about five weeks. And they even like recreated my accident of me getting burnt and uh, my school scene. They recreated the whole wow. Scarface thing. Um, and then they filmed me speaking to a group of 3,000 teenagers about the mirror and how the mirror doesn't talk. And so, yeah, it was an incredible, incredible experience. Oh, well, congratulations on that. That is, that's amazing. So congratulations with that. And so uh, tell us about your challenge, your greatest challenge. You know, I would say my greatest challenge in being in business would be the money. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, the money piece, it's, it's, it's a challenge sometimes not knowing where your next dollar is going to be. 
coming from, right? It's a challenge mm-hmm. not knowing how you're going to pay the bills and, you know, having that flexibility, um, like being an entrepreneur, your money, you don't always know how much money you're going to make, right? So cash flow tend to be an issue, right? And being a speaker, there's certain really busy times, right? From September to November is very busy. And then January to June is very busy. And so you've got like sometimes three or four months where you don't have an income coming in. Mm -hmm. And so that can be one of the biggest challenges is how else can I make money? And there's been times when I've had to go to work and have a part-time job. And then my ego gets hurt because my ego is like, what are you doing? Right? You're doing this no brainer job that's not serving you. You're supposed to be a speaker inspiring others. And, and, uh, 2020, summer of 2020 was probably, and 2019 actually, where I actually didn't have to get a summer job. And I was able to make the cash flow work and have multiple streams of income. That's another thing too, is a lot of people think, okay, I'm going to be a speaker. Yep. That's the only way I'm going to make money. But you need to have multiple streams of income so that you can ride it through the low low points and and have money coming in at all times. Yeah, I've been doing this for 26 years and so and it changes and flows and obviously 2020 was like I I'm like you I was completely booked up with speaking engagements and then they were gone in all of about 5 days. They just were like to see a whole year's mm-hmm. worth of a calendar just woof wiped woof. out. But um I have have definitely learned over the years that having uh, different streams of income and having things that, and it takes some time, but if this is going to be my strong speaking season, what am I going to make strong in my downtime? What totally. is going to fulfill that bucket? And that takes some strategic planning. Uh, but when you can make that happen, then you've got that cash flow coming in from those different buckets at different strengths and at different times. So that that's what I have found in doing it for a very long time is really important. I totally agree with you. I and then I know when I first started painting and this was about five, six years ago, and I had no speaking gigs in this one month. And so I made all my money selling paintings on Facebook. And I made something, I don't know, it was a thousand or two thousand bucks in that month or something like that, just selling paintings. It was crazy. Oh that is That is. That's great. So what's work from your happy place mean to you? That's kind of our signature question of our show. It means lots of different things to people. And so I'd love to hear what that means to you. Yeah. And and I love that you asked that question because I think it's an excellent question because I think there's so many people who stay stuck in dead end jobs that they hate. And then they wonder why they're so miserable or they do businesses they hate and they're only doing it for the money. And so for me, being in my happy place means being able to work whenever I want, right? It means having that flexibility to, like at Christmas time, it was the first time ever, but I was able to give my kids, I have three kids, each 500 bucks for Christmas. And I took myself on a trip to Mexico between Christmas and New Year's. And that gave me so much joy and happiness because I had been working so hard and you know, as you know, like as a single mom, a lot of times you just hang on to your money and you don't spend it on yourself because you never know where your next dollar is coming. Mm-hmm. And so my happy place is being able to do the work I love, make the money that I want to make, and then share it and spend it and do the things that I want to do or that my kids want to do or do as a family. And I love working from home because I'm not stuck in an office. I being that I work Mm -hmm. from home too means I can work anywhere. Like I've done work in Mexico. I've done work in London, in Africa, all these places. So I love having that flexibility to work wherever I feel like working. That is, um, that's really, I enjoy that too. So I'm so glad that you've, (laughs) Got to experience that, especially being in a job that you weren't really crazy about. So I, yeah. I'm i really happy for you that you're experiencing that and loving what you're doing. So what advice would you give to others? Because I would say you are really the true spirit of an entrepreneur. I mean, you've been super honest here today, which I love. And not every entrepreneur wants to be really honest about the tough times of it. 
and the hard parts of it. And your honesty has been extremely refreshing. So thank you for that. Oh, you're and welcome. Yeah, for sure. And what advice would you give to someone just like sitting in that office that day and your boss asked you, I love that question, by the way, you know, uh-huh. uh, I know that's a big question, right? Yeah, and was. so yeah. what advice would you give to others kind of wanting to go down this road, or maybe they've just started down this road and they're having doubts or questions. So what advice would you give to them? So the first thing I would say is that dreams are meant to be found, not tucked away in dreamland. So that's a quote that I came up with when I wrote my first book. My advice would be that make sure that you know that what you're doing is your true passion. If it's not your passion and it's not something that lights you up, then don't do it. Find something that's going to light you up. One of my passions and is that um, when I first did the blanket, someone sent me a picture of a little girl who got burnt at 18 months. And I got burnt at 20, at 24 oh. months or 22 months. And when I saw this picture of this little girl, I was like, oh, my gosh, she's going to live my life. She's going to have to go through surgeries, multiple, multiple, multiple surgeries. She's going to get teased. She's going to get bullied. She's going to get called Scarface. She... She is not going to have an easy life. She's going to be struggling. And it brought me to tears knowing that she was going to have to live through a lot of the challenges that I lived through. But I also found a gift in my tragedy. You know, when you think about my life being a two-year-old, it's tragic getting burnt as a two-year-old, you know, to most of your body and having to go through all that. But is it really a tragedy? When that girl becomes a multiple TEDx speaker who woman of distinction award and has this goal cast video with 10 million views and, you know, documentary, is it really a tragedy? And I say, no, it isn't. But the best thing that I did was that I got mentors and coaches that helped me. So I didn't hire someone that didn't know what I was doing. I hired mentors that were actually doing what I was doing. So like mm-hmm. Charmaine was my the person who got me started as a speaker. Like she became my mentor. So when I needed help, I said, Char, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help me? You know, um, I got mentors who helped me. And so I think that is critical is find people who can teach you how to do what you need to do. It's just like when I wrote my book, I mean, I had no idea how to do it, but and then I found people who could teach me how to do it, and I became a best-selling author, and now I continue to do it. So I am constantly learning new things. And that's the beautiful thing about the internet. YouTube is you know, going to be your best friend. If you don't know how to do something, go on YouTube, and you can learn anything, anything for free. So, And if you can't learn it, find someone who can, because there's tons of people out there. So... I just say, go for it. And if you don't know how to do what you need to do, put it up on Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media you love and ask for help. And I promise you, it'll come. The help will come. Wow. That's great advice. So what are some new and exciting things that you're working on right now that you think our listeners might benefit from? Well, my the best thing that I'm working on right now is coaching people to become best-selling authors. So um, June 18th to the 20th is when I'm doing my next event, and it's called Best Selling Author Mastery Live. So it's a three-day event where I'm walking people how to get their books started, publish, launch, and become a best-selling author. And then I'm having some other speakers coming on board too. Um, and then I'm going to be doing it again. I'm going to do it probably three times a year. So even if they can't come this, the next one in June, I'm definitely going to do another one in the fall. And so I also have a free gift for your listeners. And this is, yeah, and this is my blueprint. So it's a blueprint to teach them how to write and publish a book in seven easy steps. And so I love that. I know it's so cool. And then they can also book a 30 minute free discovery call with me. So I'm happy to give that to all your listeners. Well, thank you so much. We'll make sure that we put that in the show notes. And how can our listeners find you right now, Kelly, if they want to connect with you or follow you? Yeah, well, best thing is I'm I'm on all the social media. But if you go to 7stepsauthor.com, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's where they can get my free gift. They can get onto my email list and that's where they can find me there too. And book okay. the discovery call. So, and, and I also have my event stuff on there too. So that's usually the best place is seven steps to author.com. So Perfect. Well, it has been an absolute delight having you on our show today and very inspiring. It just, it makes you stop for everyone. I think every single one of us go through our own struggle and we go through our own battles. But then when you see someone that has gone through a a really difficult battle, it makes you stop and say, it does for me. Like I have got absolutely nothing to whine about. (laughs) Like (laughs) uh, it really, it does. It puts it into perspective for me. And I'm reminded of that. And it's like, if I think, oh, I can't do this. I think, yeah, I can. Cause look at Kelly, look what she went through. Of course you can. And it, that it's those stories that keep me inspired and have for many, many years, because we all have within us a resilience that is there if you dig deep and Sometimes it's being reminded what others have actually gone through and come out on the other side and look at you inspiring people and helping especially young people that have gone through a similar situation and giving back to people. And you haven't remained a victim. You have Mm. taken your situation and you have empowered others. And that's the greatest gift in the whole wide world. So thank you. Thank you. I, you're, you're so right. Like a lot of people will see themselves as a victim. And I know a lot of burn survivors, they do, they do see themselves as a victim, but you can take that and, and make your, your victim story into something empowering. And I believe that that's why we have to live through all this stuff is so that we can learn the lesson and teach other people. And so th- that's, that's why I believe I got burnt or so that I can teach other people how to love who they are and then take their story and make a message out of it and become an an author and speaker or coach. Well, thank you so much. And congratulations on all your many successes. And to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us today on Work From Your Happy Place. I hope that you'll subscribe or follow so you don't miss a single one of our incredible interviews. Until next time, we see you on Work From The Happy Place. Live your best life. What was your quote that everyone was chanting, Kelly? (laughs) Dreams are meant to be found, not tucked away in dreamland. That's a good one. But what were all those people chanting in Africa? Oh, they were chanting, I am me, the best me I can be. Right. So I encourage all of you to go out and be the best you you can be. Thank you. See you next time on Work From Your Happy Place. Thanks for joining us at Work From Your Happy Place. If you like what you hear, please share it with your friends and be sure to rate and review us on iTunes or Stitcher. For a free gift on finding your own happy place, please visit workfromyourhappyplace.com and click on the free audio button. Thanks again for listening.